Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us. Um, I think, yeah, they're on. So let me start by asking John, and maybe maybe you can uh, give us uh, uh, you can start us off. Uh, the long-term trajectory was a decline in violent crime and the murder rates in most majors, almost all major cities from the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, there was a spike, what appeared to be a spike up in the middle part of this decade. What did that turn out to be, and where are we now? Well, I think let's put it in the big perspective yeah. of this sure. country. Yeah. Uh, and the Burke perspective is that uh, the U.S. has 25 times the gun murder rate mm. of any developed country in the world. And I think we have to start by realizing that we are an anomaly. We, we just are different than any other country. Um, and then when you start to zoom in a little bit, 96 people uh, lose their lives to guns every day in America. Um, and there's no question about it that where this clusters is in cities in metropolitan areas. Before you go forward, that 96, is that gun violence, is that uh, crime or is, or what share that is suicide? It is a combination of both crime and suicide. Okay. And in fact, suicide is the larger percent okay. of that. Um, zooming in even further though, uh, you know, this is something that happens to um, it mostly in our metropolitan areas. And then getting a little bit more uh, hyper-local, it's in cities, uh, it's in part, parts of cities where we see high rates of poverty, high rates mm. of segregation. But I think that the $64,000 question that I think we need to answer, and I think uh, Chief Isom and Rosanna mm. might have some real thoughts about this, is why have some cities been successful mm -hmm. and others not? Yeah. You know, look at New York, uh, not to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 claiming my city, because there are others like LA that have done incredibly well, where you look at St. Louis and you look at Baltimore, mm -hmm. and it's going in the exact opposite direction. So you've got a city like St. Louis that I think since 2010, maybe the murder rate's gone up 60%. You've got New York down 46%. And we haven't really answered that question. And we have Chicago, where it went up quite a bit and has now started to go back down. But let's, let's start with St. Louis, and then we'll get to Chicago. What, what, what is the story in St. Louis, you think? Well, I think the story in St. Louis is, is somewhat similar to, to other communities. We had a, a dramatic reduction in violence in the city. But um, there are a couple of different sort of social issues, of course, that led to unrest in the city of St. Louis that I think did have an impact on our ability to keep those numbers down. Uh, certainly, Ferguson led to a lot of social upheaval in St. Louis that uh, wasn't just focused on the Ferguson area, but it filtered out into all areas of the community. And so I think we're struggling to rebound from that in terms of building legitimacy and trust in the police department. And so those are very big factors in communities of color, in inner cities, participating in the criminal justice process. And that's a very important component of trying to deal with these very difficult crime issues that we have in the city. So I think that is the story of St. Louis and is similar to other urban areas. Yeah, we'll, we'll come back to that. But, but let's talk about Chicago, because certainly no city uh, in the period in the middle part of this decade when there was the concern about elevated levels, no city was more symbolic of that than Chicago. As best you can tell, what is the long-term and near-term story in Chicago? I think it's an open question, and it's going to depend on what we do as a city and what we do as a country. So I think we can go the direction of New York and Los Angeles. Back 20, 25 years ago, Chicago, New York, and LA had the same homicide rate. Wow. Chicago, New York, and LA started to decrease at the same time, they kept going down and Chicago plateaued. And then we had this absolutely horrendous year of 2016, where we also had a 60% increase in homicides and shootings in one year. That is a historic event for a city anywhere close to Chicago size. Mm -hmm. we're, we're such a big city that that's a lot of people. So the size of our increase in 2016 compared to 2015 was basically the same number of people that were killed in New York City as a whole. So our increase was New York City's wow. citywide homicide number. Um, so, you know, I think we have done some things as a city to try to respond. And I think to sort of answer the question about, you know, what's happening, things are very city specific now. I think in the 80s and 90s, there was sort of a national trend that happened where things went up and things went down. 
I think there are very sort of localized things happening in cities that are sort of determining whether they're going up or down. And in Chicago, we had a set of things around the Laquan McDonald video being released, mm -hmm. uh, a, a agreement with the ACLU to change the way stop and frisk was done, uh, the Department of Justice coming in to investigate the police department, and a whole set of things and a change in police leadership at the same time. So I think we're starting to see things move in the right direction uh, in terms of things going down, but we still have a very long way to go. And I, I feel strongly that we should be comparing ourselves and benchmarking ourselves to cities like New York and LA and not say we're so different. We should aspire to have a similar homicide rate as New York and LA. But just to be clear, your view, what in your view caused the spike? And to what extent are the strategies that are now in place responding effectively so to those causes? I, I think the truth is nobody knows for sure exactly what caused it or how much did the sort of um, release of the Laquan McDonald video and the sort of- Pullback, the, the idea of a pullback by police? So what we saw was a, a dramatic decrease in stop and frisk. But that also happened in New York without a commensurate increase. Mm -hmm. The thing that I, my best guess is there was some changes in policing, but there was also changes in the way that communities interacted with police. And unfortunately, the only sort of metric that we have for what you might think of as proactive or self-initiated mm -hmm. policing in the data is the stop and frisk data. What we don't have in the data, but what I think probably was also happening was proactive positive policing decreasing. So the police officers getting out of their cars and interacting with residents, that probably also dropped and that, mm -hmm. that could have a very significant impact in the crime rate in Chicago. So I think that those things together probably contributed to the increase and we are a city that doesn't have the kind of resources that New York City has. So it's very hard for the public sector to be super nimble and respond. And so I think it, it's taken a little bit of time to start to redirect resources into things that have police doing good police work again, but also are starting to build relationships with communities and using technology to be much smarter and precise in the way that policing is done. Uh, look, I think all three of us would agree that there are uh this is a multi-strategy mm -hmm. approach. That there isn't one single thing that will do it. But one of the things I want to say is laws actually matter. And so an interesting example is Missouri that had a permitting system. Um, and when the st Missouri state legislature decided to repeal the permitting system, homicides in- Permitting uh, for- Permitting for guns. For guns. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it was a background check system mm. plus a permitting system. Um, which requires you to actually get a permit and, and inquire some, require some interaction with the police. Homicides went up 24% in the, I think, two or three years that followed it. Um, that won't be the only explanation, but laws actually do matter. Yeah, so uh, we, we've kind of touched on this, each of you have touched on this in different ways, but let me kind of uh, ask it directly. Chief, let me, let me start with you. The, the framework, uh, the, the, the argument by many critics and the administration, I think, the Attorney General, is that police reform is in tension with public safety. It's inimical to public safety. If you are asking the police to be more conscious of how they are interacting with communities, uh, they are less likely to be interdicting crime and you get more violence as a result. Uh, you know, people call this the Ferguson effect. Uh, what, is your, I mean, what is your view of the relationship in your mind between reform of police and public safety? Are they in tension or are they synergistic? Well, or neither? I, I would say they're synergistic. It, it depends on how it's presented to the profession. I think all police officers want to do better. Uh, they want to improve policing. Um, they understand that our criminal justice system is based on individuals participating in the process. When you look at a typical police department or public safety, it always starts with a citizen. It starts with a citizen calling the police, a 911 call or reporting a crime, participating in the investigation of a crime or even sitting on a jury. So. Officers are very well aware that you must have a strong relationship with the community. I think sometimes the pushback in terms of officer is how is that presented to the policing profession? Is it presented in a way that it's trying to improve the relationship both of the police department and the public, trying to come together and address some of the very difficult and systemic problems that they address every day? Or is it pointing a finger at law enforcement and saying that you're part of the problem? 
can I just... The Chicago is right in the front line of all of this. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think it's a really, it's a false choice and it's unfortunate that's been framed in that way. I actually think when you look at a city like Chicago and a police department like Chicago Police Department, that department, those officers have been failed profoundly by our failure to do a lot of the things that will come out of the consent decree. The fact that our officers are not getting the kind of training that they need is just obscene. And so I think the, the part of the reform process is actually providing them with the right training, the tools, yes, accountability, but you know, it's, and that giving them the right training and tools actually helps to reduce the violent crime. So it's, it's, it's not uh, either or. Can I follow up with one last question in this area and then we'll move on. Uh, Given the local politics in cities, is it possible to make the kind of changes we're talking about without pressure from outside, without, with the federal pressure eliminated, how much tougher is it to make, because certainly there are many mayors who privately would welcome a Justice Department investigation under the previous administration because it gave them the leverage to pursue changes that they thought were needed, but they were not sure they could drive through their local politics. How much has it changed things to have that external source of pressure eliminated? Well, so we are going to have the state attorney general. Uh, okay. So we do have that option. And I think we'll sort of see how it goes in Chicago. But I actually think there's a huge opportunity. You know, we're, we've taken sort of Chicago's challenges. And I think Chicago, in many ways, has jumped to the forefront. Cities around the country are now watching what's happening in Chicago. And one way that things change is cities learn from each other. So I think there's a huge opportunity. There were lots of insights and lessons that police departments have learned from things that New York City did right, things that New York City did wrong, yeah. that diffuse. And I think we are really a laboratory now for innovation. And I'm hoping that a lot of what we learn about how to do high quality constitutional policing that is effective for fighting violent crime can also benefit cities like St. Louis and Detroit and Baltimore and lots of other places. And Chief, can I just ask real quick, your thought on, on the removal of the outside source of pressure, how has it affected the debate in St. Louis? Well, I think um, there are a lot of progressive cities, a lot of progressive mayors that are doing um, reform every day in cities and police departments. I know in St. Louis, uh, there have been a number of different initiatives that have taken place that have tried to move the needle in terms of reform. Some of the things you don't necessarily see from the outside, mm. but they're going on every day within communities. Um, I know there is a lot of research going on in St. Louis about interactions between police um, we have a citizen review board now in the city of St. Louis. And so there are a number of things that are happening. Um, we have a, um, a shooting team that does independent investigations of uh, officer-involved shootings. And so I think there are things happening, and I think the law enforcement profession is trying to make steps to reform because they know that it's good for the safety of the public, but it's also good for the safety of the officers. Uh, officers are more safe when the community has trust in and faith in them. John, did you want to add? Uh, go ahead. No, I just wanted to uh, add another point, which is, in the end, also, this is a matter of resources, and it's a matter of mayors allocating their resources, um, whether it be technology, which has really advanced the ability for law enforcement to respond quickly, or whether it's just a matter of how many detectives do you actually have. The clearance rates in this country are abominable. I think, uh, you know, if you look at most urban centers uh, and you're looking at homicides, it's less than 50%. If you look in some communities, and I have to stress how hyper-local it has to be when you're thinking of, a, of fighting crime. It's less than 30%. If you're looking at shootings, I think in Chicago in some places, it's less than 5%. So think about the message that sends to the community. Think about the message that sends to criminals. And think about the message it actually sends to police officers. It couldn't be for the community and police officers a worse and more discouraging message. I was going to ask you, the implications, low clearance rates, do you think mean more violence? Without a doubt. I mean, without a doubt, if, if criminals feel – crime is a calculation. And if you feel Ooh. you're going to get away with it, you're going to do more of it. And is there also – if you feel that the system is not going to provide justice or that there is a you, – you provide your own? Yes. Without a doubt. And Rosanna, I think, knows a lot about talk this. About, talk about that. Yeah, no, I mean, if your son is killed, his brother knows who it is often. And if the system is not going to – 
care enough and make that a priority to solve that, it will get resolved. And unfortunately, what you end up having is one incident leads to another, yeah. which leads to another, and you get this you know, reverberation. And, and so it really does magnify the number of homicides you end up with if the system itself cannot respond. And it is absolutely true. The homicide, the shooting clearance rate, so someone is actually shot in Chicago, is 5%. You can shoot somebody with impunity in Chicago. Okay, why is that so low, though? Is it a failure of policing, or is it, it to some extent, a cultural unwillingness of the community to participate in the if, I, feeling the system is tilted against them. I, I think it has to start with the police department, but you know, all of this reform stuff or getting high quality, effective policing cannot be done on the cheap. And I think it is very hard in this environment to be making the case for more resources when everybody is very suspicious and concerned about policing. So it is sort of counterintuitive, yeah. but I think it starts with giving the police officers the training and the tools that they need and then they have to earn the trust. I don't think that they can be given the trust. They have to earn it. This is a good point to kind of a good, good moment to kind of shift focus a little bit because you've been talking about kind of the reverberating effect, the kind of the, uh, the uh, uh, one stone to stone uh, uh, in, in violence. Is the way to interdict, is a way to break that cycle fundamentally policing or is it other kind, are there other kind of interventions that you have studied in Chicago or elsewhere that are valuable in ending that cycle of ret retributive violence? I think policing is definitely an important component, but absolutely we've lost opportunities to intervene if we wait until it's a police problem to solve. So, you know, I think there are huge opportunities to do much more effective social service targeting with using administrative data as well as sort of street level intelligence about who's d most involved. I think one sort of category of intervention that I think holds huge promise is something called cognitive behavioral therapy. I would love to be able to make more progress on the thing that John is working on, which is the availability of guns, but while we're still fighting that fight, what can we do to reduce the likelihood that even given gun availability, things will not escalate to become violent? And I think this sort of category of CBT is really well, before, important. Before, John, before you come in, is there any particular pilot that you have worked on that you could describe a little bit that uh, is pro seems promising to you? Yeah, I mean, one of the things, and we don't yet have the evidence, but we, you know, with this 60% increase in homicides in Chicago, uh, it was very important to find some sort of intervention that would reach directly the people involved in the violence. And when you look at who's involved, to, as the best as we can tell, in the homicides and shootings, it, it's 75% of them are over the age of 18. So mm. we love youth programs, but if we want to stop the shootings tomorrow, we also have to have ways to reach people who are 18 and older. And so we designed sort of using the best available evidence and intervention that's combining an intensive 18-month transitional jobs program plus cognitive behavioral, trauma-informed cognitive behavioral therapy and partnering with street outreach organizations to go out and find these individuals and engage them because they are not necessarily the most trusting of uh, institutions. And so sort of combining those three things together using in part predictive analytics to mm. identify the people driving the violence. Um, and so we're testing that sort of combination of interventions and very, very encouraged by what we're seeing so far but not yet ready to spike the yeah. ball. John. Well, the Cure of Violence programs that many people have seen, the data, uh, while not perfect, is amassing that it has real impact in, in interrupting violence. Some are community-based, some are hospital-based. And these should never be either-or choices. Mm -hmm. I mean, they are part and parcel. And in the most enlightened departments that I know of, they're actually embracing these outreach programs and interrupting programs as well because they see it as part of the tools that you need in your toolbox. But what they have in common, because sometimes people think it's one or the other, is they're both hyper-local in that they try to really identify who are the people in the community who are responsible for committing the most crimes and somehow figuring out how to reach them, whether it be through traditional law enforcement uh, techniques or whether it be through intervention programs. I have to say the one component that we probably uh, just should mention is uh, we have a court system, this is a, mm -hmm. a Chicago problem in particular, uh, that uh, just doesn't seem to be able to handle these cases or actually part, uh, meet out the punishment that actually fits the crime, which is just another way of sort of saying doesn't matter, don't, don't care. And the community reads that. So even, uh, just, just to clarify, so even if you get to the point, you said so few cases are cleared, if you get to the point where someone is charged, they are brought to court, you're saying the courts don't do what? what, what, what is, what's the failure? Uh, well, the failure usually is to take seriously, for instance, uh, the criminal possession of a loaded weapon. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of court systems will say, well, but they just possessed it. Well, they actually possessed a loaded firearm. Mm -hmm. 
and the likelihood is they possessed it because they were going to either thought they needed to use it or were going to use it or had used it. And this is a problem we had in New York. Um, and I know it's a huge problem in the court system in Chicago. Uh, it's a slap in the wrist, and that's sort of being generous. Yeah, w one of the most difficult problems is that we, we can predict who's going to commit another act of violence. And generally, it's, you've already committed an act of violence. And so this issue of retaliation and how you deal with that, whether it's through prosecution, whether it's through cure violence, an interrupter strategy, or a hospital-based intervention, is all trying to get at these individuals who are uh, in this cycle of violence, who continue to commit violence over and over again. And those generally are people who are 18 and older who have gotten caught up in the system. And so somehow we need to find out how to break that cycle and how to deter them from future violence. Yeah. Did, did, you, you, did you want to add? No, I just want to agree. Yeah, okay. So let's, let's, uh, let's take a few minutes and if anybody in the audience has some questions, I think we have a microphone. If we can see. Right. We can't see, so we're gonna have to rely on the people with the microphone to, to find the questioners. Oh, thank you. Hi, uh, Andy Shore, City of Lansing. Um, the one thing I didn't hear at all as you're talking about this is, is um, any issues with mental health. Mm. Um, I mean, we see that as one of our biggest problems um, that ends out leading towards violence. So, but I didn't hear that address. So I, don't, I assume it's happening in your cities. Chief? Well, I want to take this from a, a different angle. Uh, certainly, um, dealing with mental illness is an issue that we have to address in terms of violence. But most people who are mentally ill do not commit acts of violence. So I think sometimes that's something that uh, gets mixed up in this conversation. But we also have to deal with uh, mental illness and mental health with police officers. And this tracks back to this issue of how do we build good relationships with communities? Officers are dealing with traumatic incidents and stress every single day. And the impact of that over a course of the career has an effect on how you deal with people. And you could just think of it in your life if you're dealing with trauma on a regular basis and how that affects your interactions with your family, your friends, people you interact with. And so not only do we have to address mental health issues in society as a whole, but we really have to do a better job with our police officers. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I just want to agree with that. So I mean, I think it is important to sort of state very clearly that mental health, uh, people who suffer from mental health illnesses are more likely to be the victim than the perpetrator of violence. I think, unfortunately, we live in a society where we've sort of offloaded the responsibility to deal with a lot of the sort of failures in society, including to meet mental health needs, to law enforcement. And so we've had some incredibly tragic incidents in Chicago, including one a couple years ago, the day after Christmas, where a young man was calling 911, calling 911, the police department finally ended up responding and they ended up shooting and killing him and the woman who answered the door. But part of that is it should not be the police department having to respond to mental illness. And just to the point about officer mental health, it's a really acute problem. We just, we, we have in Chicago a 60% higher officer suicide rate than most other departments. I got a, a notice this morning that a detective committed suicide over the weekend. It is a very, very profound problem and really the resources have not been there um, as well as the cultural sort of barriers around getting help. We have been in cities at the Atlantic for Atlantic events that have tried to create teams of mental health professionals and police to respond to those kinds of calls. So I don't know if that's something that you've, you've seen uh, around the country. Well, I do see uh, a greater willingness to address the issue. I think it's not as taboo as it used to be in law enforcement. We still have a long ways to go, but there are a lot of people who are focusing on it nowadays, and I think that in time it will get better. Yeah. I think just one thing on, yeah. there are some really innovative things happening though. So a Houston police department's doing a assertive community treatment where they're going out proactively, right. not waiting for the next 911 call, but using the information they have to do proactive outreach. We're piloting that right now in Chicago where we're using the administrative data to identify the people who are cycling over and over again for mental health reasons through 911, through the police department and doing proactive outreach directly into services. And I think um, Milwaukee was where they have the teams that go out of both mental health professionals and law enforcement together. Uh, let's see can we have another question somewhere? Okay, go ahead. Hi. Somewhere out there. Hi. 
Hi, my name is Paula. Uh, I'm from the city of Toronto under the leadership of Mayor John Tory. Uh, I just wanted to give a, a huge shout out for the work that you guys do. It's so incredibly hard and complex. Uh, after the summer that we've had in Toronto, um, I'm here to try to find different uh, stories and, and tests that other people have done. But two examples that I wanted to share with everyone here that the that our city's done is uh, two public examples that you could look at. Uh, Peel Region police officers uh, went to a Buddhist temple and they've been incorporating meditation into their practice. Mm. So they're uh, in uniform, they've gone to temple and uh, they're seeing what meditation might do for their mental health but also their, within their training uh, practices. And then there was another very uh, public shooting this past year where uh, because of good training, I believe uh, the officer actually didn't discharge his gun with a shooter that was up in North York. He actually had a conversation with a shooter uh, behind his vehicle and uh, they were able to arrest the arrest the shooter as opposed to uh, shoot first and ask questions mm -hmm. later. So I think those are two examples. If, if anyone wants to use those, I would encourage you to, to search for them and, and take a look. Well, can I th thank you for that. John, can I, before, I mean, we, we, we got to see the stage in a minute, but we, we talked about all the different ideas and, and, and strategies for essentially discouraging people from using the guns they have. Um, how optimistic are you that you can make a meaningful dent by focusing on that and not reducing the number of people who have guns? Uh, I think the question is not so much how many guns are there, but who gets to have the guns. And mm -hmm. I think that when you look at most of the legislation around the country, and it's noteworthy that 20 states have passed significant legislation just since Parkland, which was February of this year, uh, most of it is centered on trying to keep guns away from dangerous people whether it be red flag laws that deal with mm -hmm. people who are dangerous to themselves or others, or enhanced background checks which deal with people who are, are felons or people who are underage, or whether it has to do with domestic violence laws which are showing a huge amount of, of um, effectiveness in making sure that guns don't get into the hands of domestic abusers and that the police have the ability to remove them if they already are in And it is your view that states and cities can make a meaningful without national action? Uh, look, eventually you want national action, but in some, t in some instances, you know, Congress is the curtain raiser, and in mm. some it's the finale. And I think marriage equality was a good example uh -huh. where D.C. was the finale. I think guns, will, uh, guns in terms of legislation, Congress will be, in the fin will be the finale, but in the meantime, we're amassing significant gains um, on a bipartisan basis and having data to back it up that actually laws are a prophylactic. We are a nation of laws after all. Quick final thought. No, just to say yeah. California, I think, is a perfect yeah. example where local laws, I think, really are a part of the thing that has driven homicides and shootings down in L.A., among other Without things. a doubt. And one of the things I will say is we're seeing mayors getting more and more active on this issue. Um, they do it knowing that they're going to end up in court because uh, they may be yeah. in states with strong preemption laws, or they may be in states where the NRA feels emboldened to actually um, challenge them. But what we're seeing is in Florida, mayors banding together and fight uh, punitive preemption. In Missoula, Montana, uh, the mayor just won a case where he actually uh, passed a law saying you have to have universal background checks within the city limits. And the mayor of Seattle just won a case against the NRA uh, where when she actually passed a safe storage law. So mayors are fighting and uh, and it makes a difference. Chief, you, you're nodding. We'll give you the last word. Well, I think one thing to, to think about in terms of the availability of weapons is this is not a Democrat or Republican issue. This is an issue of saving lives and, and keeping people safe. And if you look at Texas, it's a state that is typically thought of as a red state, but they have some very reasonable gun legislation in Texas. And so I think taking that as a takeaway, there are things that we can do that keep guns out of the hands of dangerous individuals. Well, join me please in thanking this terrific panel. And we'll move on to the next. Thank you. Guys, that was great.